Well, it's great to see everybody. I know this is a little different format, but we're all going to get used to it as we go through the course of the season. But uh, it is nice to uh, nice to be available to you guys for the first time in a, in a while. But uh, after a long and challenging off season 2.0, I just have to say that we here uh, as the Mets organization, myself, our players and coaches are just incredibly excited that baseball is finally back. And we, uh, we're all kind of coming into New York here, starting our intake testing, and we're looking forward to having, having everybody report by, by the first, and then hopefully get, to get everybody ready to go for full squad workouts on Friday. Uh, hey, Brody, when last we left you guys, there were some you know, health issues, concerns for a few players, notably Joanna Cespedes, uh, Jed Lowry, and, and Michael Conforto. Could you give us an update on where all three of those guys are health-wise right now? Sure. I think uh, the important point to recognize is that none of us have been together for quite some time. And the performance staff and the coaching staff has stayed connected to our players uh, in an unbelievably incredible fashion. The, these guys uh, have continued to work. For those specific players, I think that Cespedes has been working hard. We are looking forward to him getting into camp and believe that he should be uh, closer to being game ready than we, we, when we saw him last in March. In Conforto's case, the, the time off definitely was a gift for him. He'll be back and, uh, and ready to go without restrictions here come, come the week. And then for Jed, it's been a long time since he's, since he's played in a real game. You know, he's had a situation where um, he was playing in a rehab brace, as you guys all saw over the course of spring training. Our hope is that he'll be able to continue to transition out of that brace and start to see some, uh, some more advanced action here in the coming days. Brody, when it comes to Cespedes, given the fact that there's now a DH in the NL, is it realistic to expect that he would be ready to go perhaps in that slot on opening day? We'll have to evaluate how the next few days go, but we're optimistic. You know, his, his bat can be a real impact and, and be a little bit of a separator for us as we compare ourselves to the rest of the teams in the league. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Hey, Brody. Uh, I'll ask you this one first because it's kind of becoming newsy around the league today. Um, are you expecting any of your players to opt out of playing this year? Uh, or do you think that's a possibility for any of them? And also kind of as an aside to that, uh, have you had anyone test positive for the virus to your knowledge? I'll take the thanks, Tony. I'll, first part first is that, uh, you know, at this point, we've stayed in communication with our players. We want to support them and make sure they feel safe and that they're in an environment where they can be healthy through the course of the year. At this point, we've heard that all of our players are making travel arrangements and hope to, to make it here in time this week and, and in, anticipate everybody reporting to camp. And then the second part of that, that question, Tony, we've been incredibly fortunate. I know we've seen and heard a lot of the reports from teams around the league, but we've been very, very fortunate that we've only had one player on our 40 man roster test positive since uh, since this entire entire world started being affected by it you know back in back in February so we feel feel fortunate I think it's a credit to not only the education that our players received but also the you know their best habits and best practices that they exhibited over the course of the last few months and I assume he's the player that tested positive is fine now well, I, I, I don't want to get into the specifics of it, but he's he's tested positive. He is uh, recovering, and we feel like he's in a in a good position. But we'll uh, we'll sort of wait and see once we uh, once we get everybody here in camp. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Brody, it's Tim with the Athletic. Um, can you just give some background on uh, how you went about creating the initial player pool uh, and why some of the members of the forty man roster are not on that at least as of now? Sure. Well, so first off, we are allowed to submit up to 60 players in the pool. Uh, and, you know, we'll, we'll continue to evaluate how many players we, we add to that at any given point in time. You know, first and foremost, we are all having to rearrange our spring training plans to move up to our home cities. And here at City Field, we are moving from seven fields to one field here at the main, at the main stadium. So we, we wanted to limit our numbers here originally, and then we will plan to be opening up our alternative site in Brooklyn here uh, in the coming days. Once we do that, we will likely add more players to that, to that pool. We've also added five players to our original pool that we submitted yesterday over the last 24 hours. So we're, we're up to 50 now, and we anticipate that growing here within the next uh, seven to 10 days.
Is there any expectation? I know some teams have had some have put some prospects on the player pool, guys unlikely to make an impact in the major league level in 2020. Have you guys contemplated that? Is that a possibility over the next couple of days and weeks? We, we've considered a variety of, of names and, and roster configurations, as, as you might imagine. But this, this team's built to win, and our intention is, at least at the early going of this process, is to have players in camp that we think are capable of helping us at the major league level this year. So we'll have, we'll have some younger players. I, I would, you know, we have even already Ali Sanchez and Andres Jimenez that are young players that are in our pool right now. But I anticipate adding more, like I said. But as far as younger prospects, we want to we wanna make sure that they're they're able to contribute to our, our big league seat, big league team sooner rather than later if we're going to bring them into camp. Hey, Brody. Um, so kind of two questions here. Have you met with the coaches yet in person um, since everyone has arrived back in New York? Uh, I've met with Luis Rojas so far. He, as everybody knows, we have to go through intake screening, and we've begun that. We started that on Friday. We'll be continuing it continuing it throughout the week. So Luis and, and I participated in that on Friday and the other coaches are coming in, you know, over the course of the next couple of days, once they compete, complete their screening, we'll be able to, to meet with them face to face. But we've had a lot of Zoom calls with them over, over the last few weeks. I can, I can assure you of that. Yeah. And then uh, second thing was just how comfortable are you with baseball returning as the COVID numbers continue to rise across the country? We have to be careful. And, and we have to continue to consult with our medical team. We have to consider, continue to make sure we're in touch with Major League Baseball and are following the protocols that they're advising us to do. But really education is gonna be crucial for us. You know, we are, we've gotta make sure that we understand best practices and social distancing, make sure that we know we, we're keeping ourselves, you know, uh, not only apart from one another, but also behaving in a way that's consistent to what, what's gonna keep us all healthy. And we'll continue that education, not just for behavior at the ballpark, but also when players and coaches and staff leave and go, uh, go our separate ways at the end of each work day. Thanks. Thanks, Deja. Hey Brody, uh, Justin Toscano with the record here. Do you guys, I was curious, do you guys have any players who might be high risk for COVID? I know you said nobody's opting out, but if so, what might you do to, to make them feel a little bit more at, at ease during a situation like this? Well, first off, we'll, we'll always want to protect the privacy rights for any of our any of our players or staff. But making people at, e at ease goes back to what I what I said to Disha's question is that education is is important. We we need to make sure that we start with informing our players of of what procedures are in place. We want to follow that up with helping them understand how to how to comply with those with those procedures. And then three, make sure they're respecting each other because anything that happens both here at the ballpark as well as at home and on the road is gonna impact not only what, what individuals can accomplish, but also what this team can accomplish collectively. Hey Brody, I know you were very high on this team, very optimistic in February when we talked to you. Uh, is your vision for the team the same right now in this 60 game sprint? Well, we, we still have a lot of talented players on, on our roster. You know, I think that the, the fact that we're coming in, not only with the same group that we left with, but also with some additional pieces, we, we feel like we've got a group that, that can contend. You know, when I look backwards to where we were at the end of the season last year, I think we had the best record in the National League for the last 60 games of the season last year. So if we can pick off up where we left off and go through a 60 game sprint, I think we're gonna be in a position at the end that we'll be, we'll be happy with. Does the shortened season in any way help or hurt your ball club, do you think? I think it's a track meet. That's the way I'm gonna be communicating it to our players is that this is, this is like an Olympic, Olympic you know, trials or an Olympic games where we've got a 100 meter sprint that's gonna be the first, first 20 days. We've got a 200 meter sprint that's gonna be the next 20 days. And we've got a 400 sprint that's gonna be the last 20 days to make up our 60 game season. But we're motivated, we're talented. And I know the players are, are coming in with the mindset that uh, there's a sense of urgency that we're not gonna give away any, any games in the early going. Thank you, I hope you and your family are safe. Thanks, Bruce. Right back at you. Uh, Brody, um, I realize it's a bit of a tightrope uh, on this, but do you think Major League Baseball is doing the right thing by going ahead and trying to play this season? We all want to play baseball. 
know, I know that the fans want to watch as much, uh, as much baseball as they can. That's what we all go to work for. And provided that, that we can all work together to comply with these protocols and respect, as I said earlier, res respect each other and respect the rules, I'm optimistic that we can make this, make this happen. I, I know for one that I trust the people in our, in our clubhouse, I trust our medical staff, and I know that we'll be doing everything possible to try to keep everybody, everybody safe. And, and with that mindset, I hope we can entertain people with a great product on the field because we want this team to play. Can I just follow up, Brody, by asking what would make you change your mind about that? You feel good about your team. You're only in charge of one of the 30 teams. If you saw certain outcomes on other teams, uh, would that move you to reconsider? You know, Joel, I'm, I'm focused on here. <laughs> I'm focused on now. And as we've seen over the course of the last few months, things change quickly and we learn more information by the day. I hope we learn more information by the day that will help protect ourselves, protect each other, and put us in a position to not only have a great regular season, but also a great, a great October. Thank you, Brody. Thanks, Joel. Hey, Brody, quick question on Noah Syndergaard. How is his rehab going early on? And is he in St. Lucie? Is he gonna work out in City Field? Or is he with his own trainers and PT folks? Yeah, he, he's doing well. The surgery was, was successful. And as, as we all know, Noah is as about, a, about as hard of a worker as there is on our, on our team and really in baseball. He's taken his rehab very seriously so far, as you might expect. He's going to be rehabbing down in Florida, for, at least for the time being. And we'll, uh, we'll obviously stay in close communication with, with his trainers as well as our trainers up here. And on another note, uh, MLB obviously is putting in strong recommendations on what players can or should or should not be doing at home and on the road. But teams are allowed to put in their own rules. Are you, the Mets implementing anything to that effect in terms of telling guys what they can and can't do when they're away from the ballpark, home or away? Well, for, first, those of us that have been in the tri-state area for the last several months recognize that this market – has had to look at the COVID virus in a different way than maybe some other, other markets were. So the behavior that, that we feel like we have in place right now as a community, we think is a good one. And we are gonna to continue to educate our players on how we have overcome uh, some of the initial spikes in the virus as a, as a community over the course of the early parts of this. We wanna to continue to, to improve so that we can stop this spread and continue to try to see some some declines or at least stabilization of it uh, as far as our specific rules we will continue to be strict you know i think as i said earlier social distancing is important we can control social distancing here on our on our complex and we want players to recognize and coaches and staff to recognize the importance of adhering to those guidelines as much as is reasonably possible when they go home and what about uh, rules and guidelines for when they're away from the complex? Again, rules and guidelines, we, we want people to respect themselves and we want to respect people's free, free choices to move. We're not going to uh, create penalties or fines for, for players when they leave the ballpark, but we trust them. They trust us and we trust each other. And that's how we, we feel like we're going to get through this in, in the best, uh, best way possible. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Ferdy, I was curious how much of your uh, how much of your days right now are committed to worrying about making sure this is as healthy as possible uh, work environment, and how much of your days is committed to actually being GM of the Mets. I mean, is it uh, is it a thing day to day that it uh, goes uh, one is more, one is less, or you just try and balance it as best you can? Yeah, it's hard to separate or, or distinguish between between the two. There, there's been a lot of time and effort uh, preparing for what this opportunity now, for the opportunity we now have in front of us. Uh, John Rico, who many of you know on our staff, has taken a leadership role of trying to manage the, this process of keeping, you know, preparing facilities, and, and I say that as a plural, you know, when we were working in Florida to here at City Field and, and eventually Brooklyn, you know, we, we have to make sure that we have a facility prepared to handle us, we have to have protocols that are that are in place and then we also have to have buy-in from everybody that's that's a part of it you know from my role making sure that that we are 
helping coordinate the best setup, the most efficient setup for our players' workouts, and obviously for what life is like for them inside the clubhouse is important. Building a roster and putting the team in a position to succeed is something that, that is, a, is a day and night job, so we never, we never leave that behind. But part of our success is going to be contingent on what type of environment we can create for our players here. And, and I view that as uh, you know, symbiotic to what we're doing with roster construction. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Mike. Um, hi, Brody. Good afternoon. Um, one quick question. There's been a lot of talk, from, especially for some governors, particularly uh, Governor Abbott of Texas, how they might be expecting uh, some fans at some point this season. Do you see fans at any point this season at City Field? Well, baseball, we play baseball for the fans. I know the players always are energized by the fans in the ballpark. And, and we, want, we would love to see that happen. But in the meantime, we know that we're performing for, for the fans sitting at home watching TV every night. And we'll try to give them the best show that we can and, and hopefully welcome, uh, welcome them back at whatever point it's safe. But until we have clear picture on what is safe, we'll, uh, we'll continue to play under the environment that we, that we have right now and, and try to be, uh, you know, be the best version of ourselves as possible. Hey, Brody, Mike Fitzpatrick from AP. Um, you mentioned that one player from the 40-man roster tested positive. Uh, did you guys have other players not on the 40-man test positive? And also, there's been some word that some teams are um, thinking about or looking into in order to protect their coaches, in some case, some older coaches, maybe not necessarily be in the dugout during games or have them in different spots. I, I know you guys have a relatively young coaching staff by comparison, but any, any thought um, or talk about doing that with your coaching staff, taking some precautions in that, in that way? Yeah, thanks, Mike. The first part of the question is we have had some minor league, minor league players test positive. Uh, we've been, again, fortunate that it hasn't happened on our complex, you know, at the Clover Park complex. So we've, again, tried to, to help educate our players. We feel like the environments we've created both here at City Field and in, uh, in Florida have been as safe as possible. But, uh, you know, as players have gone across the, across the country and in some cases, you know, to, to other countries, we have had some minor league players that have tested positive. And the second part of your question it really relates to accommodations. We, we're in communication with all of our coaches as we are with players and staff to make sure we identify you know, which, which employees have higher risk set or uh, skill sets, I guess, but higher risk conditions. And in turn, we're gonna make every accommodation we can to not only make them safe, but also make them comfortable. So that communication is ongoing. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Hey Brody, how are you? Great, David, thanks. Um, one, one thing I wanted to say, like, trust hasn't really worked as a national policy in, in trying to control this, for one. And two, a lot of players, you know, if any, most, I would say, like, didn't live in New York or weren't in the tri-state area, so they didn't kind of experience what a lot of what New York went through. Where do you think that the thrust um, is going to come from to kind of keep these guys in line? Is it going to be like the clubhouse leadership? Do you think that's able to do that? I mean, I know for yourself and uh, for Louie and for the coaching staff, you know, they're going to tell the players what they should do. But, you know, it's one thing to listen to it and another to, to practice it. I'm wondering if you think that, you know, the personalities that you have in that clubhouse and the fellow players are really going to be the ones that are going to be able to keep, keep your team in line with this stuff. David, you used the right word. Leadership is everything here. Leadership from our ownership group, from my position to the rest of the front office, Luis, and the players themselves. Leadership really is going to be the difference maker for the teams that are able to uh, best handle this and, and best cope with the challenges that we face. And, and that really is, is the accountability that needs to be shared by all of us, not just baseball, but, but our whole society. We need to exhibit leadership for you know, what we know at this point in time is the best best possible way of avoiding avoiding the virus and, and keeping it from spreading when inevitably it does it does you know affect people. So I, I know from what we learned in Port St. Lucie and what we learned here at City Field over the course of the last last week as we've had players here is that Luis really understands the seriousness of his leadership. I do as well. Jeff, Fred, the entire ownership group are putting it on 
uh, each other to say, let's police each other. Don't let each other lapse in our judgment. Don't let each other uh, fail to behave in a way, in a manner in which we know is in our best interest. And uh, as, as you mentioned, player leadership is important. In our clubhouse, we have a, a good blend of veteran leaders who have been part of successful teams. And we've got a young core group of players that want to win and that are motivated above and beyond anything else to, to be the, uh, the best players they can be right now. And how do we do that? We stay together. We stay together as one unit and we don't do it just for the purpose of winning games, but we do it for the safety of ourselves, our families and our, our loved ones. And, and just based on the people that you do have, Brody, can you say you're confident that this can work or what would you use to describe it? Optimistic, uh, encouraged, I mean, is confident the, the right word to use here? We're committed. We're committed to the process. We're communicated or committed to educating ourselves and each other. And we will do the best we possibly can to protect everyone involved and, and to do so with the intent to win baseball games. Thanks, Brody. Thanks, Dave. Hi, Brody. I actually have two more for you. Uh, one is regarding Cespedes and, and the DH situation. Is your expectation going into this that Cespedes will give you anything in the field or are you just looking at him as a DH? Uh, and either way, you know, what is your just general philosophy on using that DH? Would it be one guy or are you planning on using quite a few others in that spot? Yeah, well, first off, Cess is an incredible athlete. You know, when he's 100% healthy, he's got a dynamic skill set with, with all five tools. We'll want to make sure that we put him in a position to be able to utilize those, those tools that he has. From an overall lineup construction or even a roster usage, workload management is going to be very important, especially early on in the season. The ability to have a DH for our players, I think, can, can help manage that workload. Well, one, it keeps pitchers from having to prepare for, their, for swinging the bat and for running the bases, which should help them stay healthy. And for the position players, we've got Cespedes, J.D. Davis, Dominic Smith, Robinson Cano, Jed Lowry, uh, and the list goes on of the types of players that can, you know, can have the offensive profile to be able to take, take at bats as a designated hitter. Uh, and, you know, you, the list goes on when, when you start talking about Pete Alonzo and Jeff McNeil and even, you know, our younger, more athletic guys like, like Conforto, Nimmo, and Marisnik. You know, these guys you know, can get off their legs more often if we're, if we're utilizing the DH. So we feel like our lineup can be as deep as anybody's in baseball. We think we have punch. We think we have uh, guys that can impact the game with the bat. And so we're looking forward to utilizing the DH spot to both protect our guys' health and to, to put up some, some offensive, offensive force. Just regarding the structure of, of spring training or, or summer camp or whatever you want to call it, um, uh, what is your plan in terms of intra-squad games and also inter-squad games? Do you have those scheduled? Do you know will you be playing the Yankees at all, things like that? Yeah, we'll, we'll have to evolve with the schedule with more information that we see from the players and how they're responding. But the first, first couple of days, we know we're gonna have multiple sessions of workouts. And even as we go through camp, before we get into full inner squad games, we're gonna have separate, separate sessions, whether that's two or whether that's three as we go on. We're gonna intend to have multiple sessions to keep players fresh and not on the field too long, but also to have staggered, staggered workouts that we can have socially distanced practices across both both sides using the visitor and home clubhouse. As far as it relates to inner squad games, I think you'll see sim games as early as the first few days in camp where we do have, you know, nine guys in the field and pitchers facing batters in a competitive environment. Uh, as it relates to exhibition games, we're in the process of evaluating the pros and cons of that, both in terms of player performance and safety, but we'll probably have a little more information on that in the, in the coming days. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Hey, Brody. Um, hope you're well. Uh, what's uh, Tim Tebow's status uh, at this point? Was he consideration to be uh, put into the pool? Thanks, Dan. Yeah, as, as I mentioned earlier, we only submitted a 45-person player pool. That's now up to 50. So we do still have 10 spots that we haven't made final determinations on who we will be, br be bringing. You know, he was in camp with us uh, early on in camp a lot you know, last spring, and he, uh, he was sent out to minor league camp about you know, a couple weeks into it. But he, like many of the other players that were in spring training for us, will be considerations to bring back. But we haven't, uh, haven't made those final decisions, and we'll, we probably won't until we get to the point where we open up the Brooklyn camp. Thanks.
Thanks, Dad. Yeah, Brody, hope you're doing all right, you and your family. Thanks, thanks, Tyler. Right back at you. Yeah, thanks. Um, how, what is this season going to be like for you with a, I mean, one month into the season, you got the trade deadline. Like, it's just different for everybody. But, like, how are you anticipating that your job as GM is going to be different? Will you evaluate each game 2.7 times the way you usually do? Um, what are you anticipating for yourself and your staff? It's uncharted territory for all of us, you know, all 30 front offices. You know, personally, I think it's it's kind of an intellectual challenge. It, it's an opportunity to do things that we hadn't contemplated before. It's an opportunity to view not only a 60-man roster, but as we work work our way down from 30 to 28 to 26, we have all sorts of things that we hadn't previously even considered. We were going to be making a change from 25 to 26 when we started started this year. We were thinking about how to use three man or I'm sorry, three batter limits for bullpen arms. You know, now we have more available spots. We have uh, some runway to identify what our team looks like in those first first uh, four weeks as we have the full expanded roster. And then we're going to be in a position where we can look at the end of the, the month of August and say, okay, where do we stand? Hopefully we're in contention. And how do we make our team better going into September, given the situation that we that we find ourselves in? But it's going to be different. But I think the way we're looking at it is that it's going to be exciting. And hopefully it'll be exciting for the fans because none of us have seen this before. Thanks, Brody. You're welcome. Thanks, Todd. Hey, Brody, just one more thing. Are your current trainers and doctors kind of prepared to handle um, the extra COVID protocols? Or did they have to go through more training? Or did you are you planning on hiring a separate doctor entirely for that? Yeah, we, we didn't start it this week. I, I think that's the, the number one you know, takeaway here is that this isn't something that was sprung upon us and that we were just waiting to learn about the virus here, you know, now that we know the camp is starting, you know, later this week. This is something that going back to February and March, there have been countless hours and discussions you know, within our medical team and performance department with the, the HSS staff, uh, with the state governments. You know, the, the conversations that, that Jeff had with, with the governor in Florida and with Governor Cuomo here in New York have been extensive to make sure we have the best information possible as fast as, as we can get it. Um, and then we apply that to our, to our plans and our protocols. And our players have been educated and been communicated with throughout. You know, Dr. McElhaney has been in touch with our players on a regular basis. She's answered a lot of questions. And, you know, our whole medical team has been reading every study and making sure that we're on top of the latest information. So we'll continue to do that. It won't be something that stops. And we know that it will be an evolution where things change by, by the day, if not by the minute, and we'll make sure we're on top of it. Good afternoon, Brody. Hey, Danny. Um, you know, just looking, Brody, at the uh, civil unrest and what's the, been the overall climate throughout our country, what were your thoughts on seeing some of your players uh, so vocal on social media? I'm proud of them. I, I, re I really am. I, I think that, you know, our players have, have soul. Our players have a voice and our players have a platform to influence people and influence thought. Uh, you know, when I, when I heard and saw some of the comments that our players made pr publicly, I encouraged them. I wanted to make sure that they knew they had the support from the organization to use their voice, both in terms of what it felt for them personally, but also what it meant to the impact that their, that their words would have on others. So um, a number of players have also had uh, expressed feelings privately that they haven't made publicly that have also been incredibly inspiring. So we, uh, we as an organization are, are happy that our players are, are willing and able to to have a voice and want to see change take place. And we'll certainly be continuing that when we're all here together. Thank you, Brody. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Dan. Hey, Brody, uh, at what starting point would you say the, the pitchers are at right now, the starting pitchers? Are they starting to ramp up from, you know, essentially where they were at the beginning of spring training? Or as this started to seem more and more like a likely start date, did you guys tell your starters to, to try and start ramping up and stretching out as much as possible? Yeah, there, there was a bit of a, of a wave, you know, early on when none of us really knew how long this shutdown was going to be. Players tried to keep themselves at the same level that they were at the point in spring training where we broke up for, for several weeks. And then when it looked like this was going to be a little bit longer of a, of a pandemic, then 
players started to taper down. And then here in the last few weeks, they've started to taper back up. But each player has a little different method. Each player uh, understands his body in a different way. We have some players that have been, you know, throwing up to 85 pitches in, in simulated game type situations and others who, who have just been throwing off the mound in more of side and bullpen bullpen sessions. But we anticipate everybody being being in a position to to come here and, and face hitters pretty quickly into camp. And then in terms of how they progress over the course of the next three weeks will be determined, you know, on a day by day basis. Brody, just to follow up on um, uh, Fitz's question about the coaches, are, are all of your coaches definitely participating uh, in the season, as far as you know? And uh, the what you said about the uh, positive player on the 40 man, does that mean, is that somebody in your pool who, for whom you may need to use this uh, COVID injured list and somebody who would be inactive during uh, this, when spring training resumes? Well, go, go back to the first part of the question, Andy. Uh, as I said before, not just with players, but with coaching staff, front office staff, really our whole organization, we've wanted to be, you know, in communication with, with individuals who deemed themselves and, uh, and us as high risk individuals. Uh, some of our coaching staff you know, would fall into that category, you know, both at the player development level and then at the major league level. So we've, we've continued that communication. Uh, we haven't, uh, we don't have full clarity on if all of our coaches will, will be here, but we anticipate having that clarity here by, by the time we, uh, we open up on Friday. And then the second part of the question is, you know, I, I think I understood it. Will we have a player on the COVID IL to start camp? Is that, was that the question? When you, yeah, you, earlier you made it sound as if the player on your 40 who tested positive might not be fully recovered. So will that impact somebody without outing that person right now? Will that impact somebody who we think may be active at the beginning of spring training? We yeah, may po po possibly, but the, the protocols obviously are fairly extensive to protect not only the individual who, who has the virus, but also the rest of, rest of the teammates and the, and the coaches. So we'll, we'll continue to follow that protocol outlined by baseball, but we're, we're optimistic that that player can return, you know, as early as the start of camp or, or hopefully soon thereafter, but it's just so hard to predict with this, with this virus. Hi Brody, um, Mike Mancuso from WFAN and CBS. Um, how tough will this season be on a first year manager? I think this, this season is going to be new for everyone. In some ways, I think Louis may benefit from the fact that all of his peers are going through a, a situation that they've never been through before themselves. And Louis, as he did this past off season and working with his coaches, you know, he, he spent a lot of time preparing for what this season might look like. And he and Allard Baird and the rest of the coaches have been working on hypothetical spring training or now summer camp schedules for months. And now that we have more clarity on what the rules are, that's fast forwarded here over the course of the last couple of weeks. And I know he's very excited about having the, the depth of talent that he has to, to create lineups every day. And, and, uh, and I know he'll be, he'll be ready for it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks Mike. Hey, Brody, I'm just wondering if you guys have officially named uh, the infection control prevention coordinator as outlined in the, uh, the operations manual for Major League Baseball. Yeah, we, we've been working with Major League Baseball, our medical staff and our performance staff to make sure that we were fully compliant with all of the personnel that we that we will have in place. And we've been we've been putting that that action team together and, and we're ready to go this week. Is that someone who was already on your staff? Yes. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Hey, Brody. Um, given the short season, the 60-game season, and given how important a bullpen is in a 162-game season, how do you feel about your bullpen's depth and the ability to handle all the new rules, the extra inning rules, the three batter rules? And it all kind of combines into making managing a bullpen challenging. Well, first, Rich, good to, good to see you. I hope you're, hope you're feeling, feeling well. Uh, you know, the, the bullpen is something that, we put a lot of time and energy in uh, into the off season, both in terms of programs for the players that were returning, as well as some of the new faces that we added added through free agency. Uh, we added Hunter Strickland to to the club here uh, and to our player pool earlier today. We're gonna we're gonna view this as all hands on deck. You know, we've got some you know players who pitched in the big leagues for us for parts of the last couple of years who have options. We have players, you know, obviously with some more veteran experience and we've got a 30 man roster to work with out of the start 
you know, at the start of the season. And we have 28 roster spots until the end of end of the first month. So we're, we feel like we've got some weapons and my confidence in the bullpen is still sky high. And, and I hope that everybody shows up here and is able to maintain their health and, you know, pick up on the steam that they had when we broke, uh, broke camp and, and hopefully can, can move forward quickly. Thanks, Brody. All right. Thanks, Rich. Does the nature of a 60-game season change the way you look at your rotation? And, and specifically, does it change the way you look at Seth Lugo and or Robert Kesselman? Might they be used as starters? Might they be used as openers or anything outside the box like that, just given that it's a shorter season? Yeah, well, for, first off, we will always be thinking creatively on how to use our, use our players most effectively. There's no question that the short season makes every game that much more important. And we'll find out more about our starting pitchers here in the coming days and weeks to see how, how many innings we think realistically they can be effective in the early part of the season. But having Seth, having Robert Kesselman, both guys that have real flexibility to be multi-inning guys and or, or even be starting pitchers in some capacity are, are advantages that I think we, we have and that shouldn't be lost in the depth that we have of starting pitching as you factor those guys in. We also have you know, some, some high velocity, high stuff bullpen guys that as we look at how we might use them in whether it's a, you know, in between starts for someone who might need an extra day or whether we haven't, you know, seen the schedule yet. So I don't know exactly how this is going to, going to shake out, but, you know, we may, we may see shorter starts from, from certain pitchers early on in the year. And we, we may see bullpen arms pitching in situations earlier than maybe they otherwise have been accustomed to, but, we're going to use, uh, use it with the mindset that every out counts, not just every inning. Do you anticipate going into the season with what you would call a traditional five-man rotation, though? Heading into this season now? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that we, we definitively have five starters that, that are, you know, have track records of success in that role. I would envision those five starters being, being in place, hopefully, if they're, if they're healthy. And whether or not we add to that mix – will be determined by you know, how, the, how the arms and bodies of those guys respond and, and also the effectiveness of where the bullpen arms are at that point. Cool. Thank you. You got Very it. Good. Thanks, everybody. See you Friday.